Hi, I'm Rebecca Szymanski. I'm a reporter, and we are here at Issue 30 in Palm Springs, and I'm here with Dr. Chelsea Juarez. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, could you introduce yourself and kind of talk about a little bit about your work? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Dr. Chelsea Juarez. Um, I am a California native. I was born and raised in Merced County in um, Gustine, California. Actually, it's a little tiny town. Still has about population 2,500. Um, very rural. I did my undergraduate work at UC Berkeley. Go Bears. <laughs> and I did my PhD at UC Santa Cruz. Go Slugs. Um, and prior to becoming a professor at Fresno State, which is where I am now, I was a professor in North Carolina for five years at NC State. So now I'm assistant professor at Fresno State and um, I'm loving it. I'm doing forensic anthropology in the Valley, working with lots of students from diverse backgrounds and really excited. Can you talk a little bit about how you got interested in forensic anthropology? Yeah, so I think, and if you talk to my mom ever, she'll, she'll identify this one very specific moment. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I told you that we lived in a rural place. Very, we, we didn't have um, neighbors for miles around. And um, when I grew up, we, there was a dairy sort of walking distance from our house on a, a, along a long road. And they often had cows that had died. And you know it was sort of like a science lab, an early science lab. And so I, I was able to keep a little notebook. And I'm talking about being like 8 to 10 to 12 years old at this point. And I took notes about death and decomposition and the postmortem interval. I mean, of course, I didn't know at the time that you know it was called those things. But um, I noted all kinds of changes to the body um, that, that the body goes through during these processes. And so I sort of put that in the back of my mind. And um, when I went to Berkeley, I thought, like most people um, who come from sort of rural areas, you know, you can either be a dentist, a doctor, a lawyer, or a veterinarian. Those were kind of our options, especially when your parents um, haven't gone to college. And so I thought, oh, I, I think I want to be a medical doctor. And um, I got a, an internship at the Berkeley Free Clinic, and I got my taste of actually working with patients. And I hated it. <laughs> so it was, it was sort of this cathartic experience because I realized that the preparation that I had been doing up until this point wasn't leading me to the place that I wanted to go in terms of my happiness level. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, there was a, a great doctor there who said, you know, what about, um, what about this do you not like? And I said, I really get a lot of anxiety about working with living people, you know, testing them, telling them bad news, things that are going to change their life. It, that really upsets me. And he goes, well, you like the science part of it. And I said, yes. And he's like, well, you're good at that. So what about dead people? And so this light sort of, you know, turned on. And simultaneously, the good luck of, of UC Berkeley, I took a forensic anthropology class. And I wasn't an anthropology major. And I sort of sat in the front row of that class every single day and was just mesmerized. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I had to change my major and I had to stay an extra year. And I had to get research experience. But um, Lori Hager, the teacher who taught that class, was a great mentor to me. And um, she really took me under her wing. She wasn't a forensic anthropologist either, but she knew people who were. And um, she kind of steered my education and guided me to Santa Cruz where I worked with Dr. Allison Galloway, who was and is a, a very famous and um, awesome forensic anthropologist and a great role model for a young woman coming up. Mm -hmm. So, um, how, how would you say like, that childhood interest informs your work now? Like, did it, does it look, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, but looking back, can you, does it look kind of like a natural flow? It does in a way, because I think, you know, it turns out that not everybody can deal with death. And at the time, of course, you know, being a kid, I didn't realize that that was a thing, a thing to be scared of or a thing to be worried about. Um, to me, it was just, I don't want to call it entertainment, but, um, you know, we lived really far out in the country. We didn't have television, really. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time reading books or playing outside. Even when I got, you know, 15, 16, we really just didn't have a lot to do out there. And so um, being able to watch as bodies transition over time through stages of decomposition really kind of got my sort of um, 
my mind thinking about, well, you know, I see clear stages here. Can I track those stages? Can I write them down? Can I describe them? And later on, I remembered that very clearly, especially when I worked my first forensic case, which was um, a case where there was advanced decomposition. And, you know, when the body bag opened up, I just look at it and there was no paranoia, there was no panic, it was just sort of like every day. Mm -hmm. And I think at that moment I kind of knew that I had chosen the right field for myself. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, we see sometimes when, you know, it's played for laughs or for comic effect when in, you know, like a sitcom or something, but when people realize what they're dealing with, it can be kind of a shock. Is that something that people can get used to? If people are considering going into the field, is that something that you feel like they need to consider ahead of time, or is that some people, something that you've seen people acquire and be able to work through? Well, you know, the thing is, is that there's been the good and the bad of the CSI mm -hmm. effect, right? I mean, we're reaching so many more students now, even kindergartners know what forensic anthropology is. And that's a great thing. But the depiction of forensic anthropology on TV has some aspects of reality, but there aren't the true components, yeah. sort of the dirty, stinky, nitty gritty parts are, are really kind of whitewashed over for television. And I always talk about that in the context of my classes. And we have a forensic anthropology lab at Fresno State, and students get the opportunity to do things like work with our domestic beetle colony. So the domestic beetle colony is a bug box. It's a big, huge sort of Tupperware box where we put decomposing remains and let the domestics eat the tissue off. And it smells really bad, and there are maggots, right? <laughs> All the disgusting components of forensic anthropology. And I think that's a, a great tool for students to come in contact with mm -hmm. just to see, right? Because a lot of times people will come into the lab and they have this misconception that we're out there in our white clubbing outfits <laughs> going to the crime scene, you know, and collecting evidence. And it's really not like that. It's not a glamorous job, but it is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if the students are really dedicated, um, most of them can get over any fears that they have about that gross stuff. Mm -hmm. And then how, what, what led you to looking at missing persons cases within anthropology? Well, my father was a, um, an immigrant from Jalisco, Mexico, and my, um, my family is really from the Jalisco, Michoacan area. And so as an undergrad at UC Berkeley, um, I knew that I always wanted to do something um, focusing on the Latino community. And you know, as a freshman, I didn't know exactly what that was. I spent a lot of my time working for the College of Chemistry. Um, and as I transi transitioned over to become an anthropology major very late in the game, I already knew a lot about isotopes, um, about things like NMR, about chemistry, because I worked in the chemistry lab at, at UC Berkeley almost the entire time that I was there. Um, and so I knew from reading non-anthropological papers that we could source, meaning we could estimate region of origin or we could track um, things like drugs or plant material or even pottery um, across a landscape. And I thought, you know, within my own community there is this problem that's happening. I wonder if we can track human remains. I wonder if we can do that in a modern context. And so when I came to grad school, I presented my, my advisor with two ideas, and one of them was that idea. And she said, this is what you've got to do. You really have to focus on this. This is part of you, who you are. It's part of your history. Um, and I think it'll be a great contribution. So that's how it started. Mm -hmm. And then um, how, how did you, did you start out kind of regional focused where you were? Or at what point did you kind of get connected to the border issues? Um, and I know it's a wider issue than that, but at what, did, do you kind of start there and move out? Or? Actually, it was always a border issue. Okay. I started out mm -hmm. as looking at, you know, how can we identify, um, well, it's, it's a multifaceted question, right? Because mm -hmm. isotopes are not really great at identifying a region. They're really good at saying a person is not from a place, mm -hmm. right? So what they can do in terms of identifying a region is they can suggest these are possible matches based on the, the isotope chemistry of this particular individual. Um, and so for me, I, I came up with the project of seeing if we could use isotopes in the modern scenario of undocumented border crossers, deceased undocumented border crossers. And what would it take to make it work in that scenario? 
And it turns out that um, my ISTOP advisor, Dr. Paul Koch at UC Santa Cruz, was a really great influence on me. And, and he, you know, we sat down and we put heads together and um, he said, you know, what you need is a people map. You need to go to Mexico. You need to collect tissue samples from people from different regions. Um, because if somebody is actually born in Mexico and coming to the US, then you need to know what that birthplace isotope map looks like. And so that's what we did. And now we have several maps. We have maps of strontium values from human tooth enamel. We have maps of oxygen values from human hair. We have maps of oxygen values from drinking water, both bottled water and tap water. And all of these maps, databases if you will, they are there for comparison among unknown samples. So we know what, let's say for example, Jalisco looks like with all these different isotopes. What do we know about this unidentified person, right? And so we use those maps to help kind of give us an idea about where they might be from. How do you take those samples? Um, can, they, can they be done on living people or? So the samples that can be done on living people would be mm. hair okay. um, or fingernails or if you get a tooth that's pulled out for you know orthodontic reasons then we can take a sample like that mm -hmm. so for example um, when i first started my project my dissertation work at, when i was at uc santa cruz some of the first samples that we got were from clinica de salud in the salinas valley they were some of the first clinics that helped me um, and i what i did was i identified clinics that served migrant populations and so I went to these clinics and I explained to them about my project and I gave them a proposal and they had dental clinics and they supported it and so they donated teeth that had been removed for orthodontic purposes to the project so they were obviously all from living people right mm -hmm. and then they became part of the project and the people that um, the teeth were removed from gave consent mm -hmm. and then we incorporated those those teeth in the project mm -hmm. so in terms of how cases come to the lab at fresno state and how we test those materials most all of the cases that come to the lab the people are deceased um, and they come from all over the country. I just finished up a case from Illinois um, and another case from North Carolina. Um, in both of those instances, the people had been unidentified for over a 10 year period. And so they were suspected for not being from those regions, so not being a resident of North Carolina for a long term period and not being a resident of the Champaign area for a long term period. So, um, you know, in some cases, they might be undocumented border crossers that make their way up to, to these localities. In other cases, they could actually be citizens and then they're just not from those places and then where could they possibly be from? Um, when you're doing these maps or and these databases, because um, kind of, it seems like it kind of, the, the terms kind of both work, um, about how many samples do you need from an area to feel pretty confident that you've got, you know, the, an idea of how to match or, or exclude from that area? You know, that's a really good question. And what we do to determine the number of samples that's necessary is we conduct power analysis. Um, but in order to do power analysis, um, to kind of understand how many samples you need, you need to know something about the variation. So let's talk a little bit about how we decided how many samples we needed to cover an area when we were making drinking water maps, for example. So the first thing that we do is we look at precipitation maps for the area. Mm -hmm. And we look at topographic maps. Are there changes in altitude in the region? Um, do we expect that drinking water changes will occur over you know, a relatively small area? Um, and then we, based on the, the precipitation values from precipitation maps, we can kind of make estimations. The tricky thing about Mexico is that, um, and this is something that we found in our data when we made these maps, for populations that are alive now um, that are between 40 years old and older, the tap water maps from Mexico work fairly well to, to help us understand birthplace. Um, for populations that are younger than that, the tap water maps don't work very well. And the reason for that is because at around the 40 year cutoff, um, anybody that was born after the, the great earthquakes of the 1980s, like in Mexico City, mm -hmm. there was a, a very large loss in confidence in the municipal water system. And so people stopped drinking tap water. And not only in Mexico City, but this is a phenomenon that's happened across the board in Mexico. Mm -hmm. People have gotten diseases, there have been overfluoridation, um, the tap water isn't clean, it's not sanitary in some locations, and so people drink bottled water. 
early on for people who were around their 40s, that bottled water was actually local tap water that was cleaned through filtration processes in local areas. And so you didn't see a lot of distinction with the isotope maps. But now, in addition to the eight or 10 large producers of bottled water, like the Coca-Cola company or Pepsi, there are over 6,000 individual producers of bottled water around the country. And it's not regulated like it is here. And so these bottled water individuals who are producing water may be coming from a completely separate state and the bottled water might be from a separate area. And this might be making up a large portion of what people are drinking. And so what we've had to do now is to collect these bottled water samples. And so for the younger populations, that's what we are really seeing, more of a focus on bottled water. Um, and that certainly changes how the maps can be used. So it's really important especially if you're dealing with um, Latino populations that you know something about the biological profile of this person. What's their age, right? Um, what's their ancestry? Is this gonna be a relevant um, uh, comparison for that person? When you do that first analysis, are, are you usually working with skeletal remains? Yeah, so we okay. do teeth, bones, mm -hmm. most of the time, sometimes we do hair. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, if remains are really decomposed, finding hair mm -hmm. is difficult. Um, so we usually focus on teeth and bones. So that first analysis where you're doing like your height estimates and you're, you're um, trying to make, you know, educated guesses about, or, or at least exclusionary guesses about gender and everything like that, that plays all the way through so that, you know, if you would get regional, you get, and you're, you, that age comes back into play, for example. Right, so the first mm -hmm. thing that we do um, mm -hmm. is we, either I do it or some other forensic anthropologist has done the biological profile. Mm -hmm. That's sex estimation, age mm -hmm. estimation, ancestry estimation, and stature estimation at the end of life. Okay. Um, so that's a really important component. And mm -hmm. for example, in the case that I just finished for Illinois, I didn't do the biological profile. It was done by another colleague of mine. Mm -hmm. But we were in constant contact. Um, I knew the, the sex, the estimated sex of this person, right? Mm -hmm. I knew, you know, a lot of things about them. And so I also knew that, um, for example, um, I needed to be kind of focusing not only on the Illinois area, but we didn't expect that this person was going to be an international. We mm -hmm. thought that there was a very high likelihood because of what was found with the person, et cetera, mm -hmm. that that person was probably going to be from the U.S. someplace. Um, and it turned out that the person was also um, quite young. Mm -hmm. So we also thought that there was a high likelihood that they were going to be maybe not from Illinois, but from another um, location within the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's really important information and it does carry through. The other thing, there's, there's some interesting things about isotopes and the way that they're used that become important when you're interpreting um, data about a case or about a person. So for example, I gave you the example about the bottled water scenario in Mexico, but we have similar situations in the United States. So for example, in San Francisco, the drinking water for San Francisco isn't from San Francisco. It's from the Hetch Hetchy Dam, which is quite a ways away from San Francisco. So if you were to test the hair of somebody who lived in San Francisco and drank tap water, that tap water would be the same as the Hetch Hetchy water, which is not, it's an inland water supply. It's not a coastal one. And so if you're dealing with regional populations, you really need to know what are the habits, you know, what are the municipal scenarios going on so that the types of data that you produce with isotopes can actually be helpful. And I, th I think you mentioned, you used the phrase that this tells, tells you parts of the story of someone. Right. So would some from, someone from San Francisco end up having in their teeth the water from the dam, but in their hair the water, the local water? So or? the, um, so this is a great question, mm -hmm. right? So we test multiple types of isotopes. Mm -hmm. So I talked a little bit about oxygen and hydrogen. We also test carbon, um, nitrogen, and strontium. And the strontium, um, if we test that strontium from the bones or the teeth, then we're really testing the strontium that the body is taking in as a result of diet. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, our San Francisco person was eating locally, um, then they may have a value that is more consistent with that um, coastal, sort of central California, northern California um, location. Um, but if we're talking about the strontium that kind of comes through from the water supply, right? From washing your hands or from taking showers, that's a totally different 
um, uh, level. And so it really, again, depends on um, where the water that comes out of the tap is coming from. So if this is still Hetch Hetchy water, then it will mm -hmm. still have that, that Hetch Hetchy strontium value on it. Okay. Um, do you get strontium from food as well? Yes, okay. food. Um, food is actually the, the major component. You can also get it from things that you drink, but okay. yeah. For oxygen, it's primarily water, mm -hmm. and food represents a very minimal component of the oxygen composition of our bones and our teeth. So um, what you described with bottled water, as food gets more centralized and we, and we, you know, we might be farther from the farm it's coming from, um, processing's getting centralized, you know, Tyson companies, types of things like that, um, does that affect um, food and strontium the same way that the bottled water, water companies were? Not so much because okay. there's been some studies, a lot of the phenomenal um, isotope studies looking at these types of questions have come out of um, colleagues from the University of Utah. And um, they created this concept of the U.S. supermarket diet, meaning that you know most of us yeah. go to the supermarket um, maybe we go to Vons or something and we buy our chicken, right? Um, even for U.S. supermarket diets, there is still a local component. And thus far, that local component has been sufficient enough to be able to differentiate people on the basis of these tissues. So um, the situation that we see in Mexico with bottled water, let me put it in perspective. Mexico is the largest per capita consumer of bottled water in the world. Huh. Um, so we're simply not there on the level of the United States. And I also think that um, there's, a, there's a green environmental movement here in the U.S. And I think that people are really more focusing on green ways of um, kind of drinking water from the tap. So if you're concerned that your water might have, you know, some issues with it, people are investing in filtration systems and this kind of stuff. So they're still accessing that tap water for cooking and drinking in some way. And they're certainly not uh, showing the behaviors that we see in Mexico for, for bottled water. So the environmental movement kind of works in your favor as people get reconnected to the environment around them. I believe so, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Eat locally, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, locally, buy locally. Um, given that y you talked a little bit about how the po the populations that you're working with, um, they can come from anywhere, but there's certain populations, certain demographics that might be a bit more vulnerable. Um, and then they, for you know, uh, Colleen and Margaret mentioned uh, populations that don't have records or populations that don't have family nearby. Uh, how does that affect your work? D well. In order, if we're, if we're specifically talking about the um, identification process for undocumented border crossers, it's very mm -hmm. complicated. Um, and isotopes are only one small part of a very like multifaceted, multi-staged type of um, kind of analysis that happens, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to make these kinds of identifications, you often have to have a trans-border um, community that's involved in, in this. Um, that, that might include family members from across the border. That certainly often includes consulate members, um, Mexican consulates that, that work in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in Raleigh, we were really fortunate. We had some really great Mexican consuls that were there. Um, same thing with California, really good Mexican consuls who are very aware of this issue um, and who understand that um, there's a difference between maybe family repatriation or at least repatriation of knowledge and something like a criminal prosecution, right? And so that's important because what you need is access to the family, right? You need somebody to give information to um, and maybe somebody to kind of come forward and give a DNA sample later on down the line. Are most of the cases that come to you, have they already been checked against kind of the existing databases and so they're coming to you because they haven't found a hit? Yes, and the other thing too that you have to remember is that being a West Coaster um, and mm -hmm. you know somebody from the, the southern and western areas of the U.S., we are really aware of what's going on at the border. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only place where people who are undocumented are, right? So we find undocumented people who die 
in places that are not used to having undocumented populations, or maybe they're not aware of the size of their populations. And that was certainly the case in North Carolina. You had instances where most of the law enforcement couldn't speak Spanish, right? I mean, it wasn't relevant to you know their daily life before, but if you think about this, North Carolina, even though it's super small, is the ninth in terms of population for Latinos in the US. And they simply haven't reached, you know, that that capacity of really kind of knowing what's going on at the border. Now in the past five years, that's really changed a lot. There's some really awesome work going on. But I imagine that that's a scenario that happens repeatedly in places where people did not realize where they are in terms of their Latino populations or where they are in terms of their undocumented immigrant populations, right? They don't have things in place to kind of know what's available to them. So for example, most of our law enforcement weren't aware of Colibri, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't even know that there was a place beyond NamUs that they could submit DNA where they actually may <laughs> have the chance of getting a hit. Right, and so it's just a matter of getting the word out about the services that are available for people who work on the border or whose states are, have a segment of the border. They tend to be very much in the know, and mm -hmm. so it's a different ball game. But there's a lot of good forensic investigators out there, and that was definitely the case that I found in North Carolina. Very dedicated, worked hard to get people identified. Because so we talk a lot about the quality and the quantity of a database being a good idea, and it seems it seems like between the conversations about GEDmatch and Calibri and Namus trying to build build recognition, it seems like awareness is an additional factor because Absolutely. you need people on both sides to contribute, or otherwise, you know, you put your sample in for the person in front of you, and there's no hit, or the family puts it in, and and whoever has the person doesn't know how to check, so that gap needs to be bridged before databases can kind of get their full power, I guess. I think that that's definitely something to take into consideration. And the other thing is, where do we need to give that information? Like, mm -hmm. for example, where in law enforcement, right, is the place where this information is needed? And if you think about it, it's often the populations of law enforcement that deal with cold cases. Because what happens is, you find a body, right? You, you take a DNA sample, you put it into something like NamUs, and you get no hits. Mm -hmm. And then a year passes, two years pass, right? And then it goes cold because you have so many other cases that are happening. And so there's a lot of criteria that we can use to identify somebody who might be a potential um, person that's undocumented um, or a person from a, a community that's not US born. And we need to reach out to the law enforcement who's dealing with cold cases and kind of let them know about these different databases that are out there. Um, and that these different databases might be tools for them to use for their DNA samples, or if they want isotope profiles. Is that, um, the, you know, some of, like NamUs has done a good job of kind of using law enforcement to crowdsource their DNA collection. Um, is that something that could be done with like strontium samples as well to help build those maps and databases? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of people now who are working on isotope collection at the U.S.-Mexico border, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. And there are some really good websites um, that are available that, that do just what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and the only problem that we have right now is that um, the websites that we have, like ISOMAP, they, they don't currently allow um, investigators to overlay different types of isotopes. Um, so for example, really to kind of get some great information up on somebody, you need to overlay multiple isotope types. So you need to overlay strontium with oxygen, um, maybe with hydrogen, maybe with carbon, et cetera. And we don't have the capability to do that right now, but it is coming. So yes, those things do exist. Um, and um, our ability to kind of overlay this data is definitely coming in, in, a, in a place where anybody can use it. And this is a field that's changing a lot, and I'm I'm realizing I don't know the elements that are involved. Um, so can you talk, like, has it changed since you entered it? Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, one of the slides that I showed in my talk was a slide um, that had a, a piece of hair, a tooth, mm -hmm. um, and a bone on it. And there was a list of isotopes that we could get from each one of those tissues. So when I first started um, doing isotopic analysis many years ago, we couldn't get strontium from hair. Right, and so in the past about eight years, that that has been something that people have been really, really working on, um, 
trying to be able to get strontium from here and now it's something that's commonly done. It's quite expensive, but it is something that's commonly done. Another thing was the extraction of strontium from water, also still quite expensive, but something now that's much more commonly done. Um, and um, there's been some phenomenal publications in the last decade about um, using mathematical modeling and looking at different isotopes and predicting isotopes mm -hmm. based on things that we know, for example, about precipitation. Um, so that's also really powerful, and that's kind of the forefront of my new work, is using mathematical modeling and predicting things like migrational pathway based off of different tissue samples that we know um, or we have from a victim. So and I think that's going to be really important with things like human trafficking. Tracing it backwards, like where, where they came, their routes basically? That's right. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's the new um, like frontier of my work. Wow. Um, and uh, I have a great colleague. Um, Dr. Belinda Apka at, at um, NC State University in Raleigh, and um, she's a phenomenal mathematical modeler. So we've been working on that, and we just um, co-authored a paper together about mathematical modeling and um, kind of thinking about hair and drinking water and estimating um, region of origin using mathematical modeling. So that's the new frontier for me. Can you kind of describe, and I'm, I'm totally new to this, so are, are we talking like swabbing something and then What's the process, swabbing it, scanning it, like what's the process look like and what are the elements that you're checking for? Mm -hmm. So the first thing to know about isotopic analysis is that the tissues that you look at are going to be destroyed. Okay. Um, so traditionally what happens is, um, let's say I get a full case that comes into the lab and um, I do a biological profile on that person. It's a skeletized, skeletonized case. Um, and then what I would say is I'd call the investigator and I'd say, okay, this is my report. And I'd say, you know, I have the capability of doing isotopic analysis to confirm or disconfirm that the person is consistent with the area where they were found. So that would be the, are they a resident mm -hmm. uh, of this place? Are they born here? Um, do the isotopes support that? Or um, maybe were they born someplace else? Were they a short-term resident of this location? Yes or no? And so depending on the tissues that we have available, we can answer those questions relatively, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we have long hair to deal with, then we're talking about months, right? Mm -hmm. But if we have no hair, then we're really talking about um, thinking about a five-year period, like looking mm -hmm. at a rib, right? So what will happen is we'll take a tooth. Um, if one is available, we prefer the first permanent molar. Um, we'll take a piece of the rib, um, and we may take a piece of the femur. Um, these, for the tooth, we separate enamel from dentine. If you want to do time sequence analysis, meaning you want to actually look at different layers of a bone or a tooth, you can do that. So you can go in and you can say, okay, this layer that I'm testing right now um, represents this age period. And this layer that I'm testing right now represents this age period and therefore this time period, right? Or you can take a homogenized sample, so maybe you get all the enamel that you can collect and you homogenize it, and then that represents this homogenized birthplace sample. Okay, so you can do that. You can do either of those types of analysis for any of those tissues. Um, and then you can test them for strontium, which is a geologically specific isotope, strontium 8786. You can look at oxygen. Um, which is also geologically specific, and hydrogen. And so oxygen is going to come from drinking water, mainly. Strontium is going to come from food, if we're looking at that kind of strontium. If we're looking at strontium in the hair from washing or from hand washing, that's the local environment strontium coming through the, the tap water. Um, and then we can kind of put the story together. Oxygen, excuse me, carbon and nitrogen isotopes tell us something about diet. And that's proven to be really helpful in scenarios of, for example, um, the Korean War. So if you had a commingled grave and you were looking for Americans and all you had was fragments, you can go in and you can analyze dietary differences and you can clearly find Americans which have a diet focused on corn versus um, individuals from Asia which have a diet focused on rice. And so you can use that dietary separation to kind of put individuals in one camp or another. So depending on the story that you want to tell, right, and the question that you want to ask, you can incorporate more or less isotopes and more or less tissues and get an idea about birthplace, get an idea about location for the past five years, mm 
get an idea about location for the past 20 years, or maybe if we're talking about fingernails or hair, get an idea of location for the past months. And so, you know, you have to make decisions. Yeah. And um, you can do about um, three tissue samples. So let's say um, a tooth, a rib portion, and a femur portion for under $500 for all of those isotopes, carbon, yeah. oxygen, strontium, um, all of those isotopes that you're interested in. So it's fairly inexpensive. Yeah. And um, there are several labs around the country that can do this. They all charge different prices. Some of them are mm -hmm. private, so they'll be more expensive. When you describe the teeth that way, it almost reminds me of tree rings, where you can mm -hmm. they're wider or smaller depending on like the rainfall. Um, so if you if you go through by layer, you can almost it, it's almost a little bit similar. Um, for if for if you're working in a situation like you described with the commingled remains in another country, is that something where they can send you the samples or the results, yeah. or do you have to go in person? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. I often get samples sent to me. Mm -hmm. um, the cases that I just finished up, samples were sent to me, and it's not a problem. Um, you know, the, the thing that you have to do is when you communicate with your investigators, you mm -hmm. need to explain to them what kind of data can you get from what kind of tissue sample. Mm -hmm. And then obviously there's what's available, right? Yeah. Um, so sometimes you simply don't have a rib available or there isn't a tooth available, right? And so you're limited in the story that you can tell and the questions that you can ask. But as long as the investigator understands what kind of data they can get from a different tissue type and a different isotopic analysis, then it works pretty well. And you know, one thing that's come up several times at this conference or, or will over the next, between the workshops and the presentations, are high fatality incidents. Um, which can sometimes le lead to mass graves or commingled remains. So is that something that you deal with, like do you usually deal with one or two cases at a time or can you deal with a, a set like that? So we are a small lab. Mm -hmm. We are a really small lab and we don't have um, some of the mass spectrometers on our campus that we need to run this analysis. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we often partner. For example, we run our strontium analysis at the University of Champaign-Urbana in Illinois. Um, and they have a, a great um, strontium lab, a TIMS lab there. And so there are several labs across the country that have that kind of machine um, that, and, and really I bring this up because it's the mass spectrometer that is the, the, the bottleneck, if you will, on how many cases you can process. Um, because these machines are not just dedicated to this kind of analysis, right? Lots of people are running samples on these types of machines. and. The labs that are really trustworthy, the labs that publish their, um, their precision and accuracy data, right? Those labs are taking casework or samples from across the country. And so you're in a queue for your samples to get processed. And so, um, as I mentioned um, before, there is the University of Utah lab and they have um, both the, the, the public lab at the University of Utah and they also have a private lab, Isoforensics. It's a much larger lab than what we have at Fresno State. And so if you have something where we're talking about thousands of individuals um, and you have a, you know, you need the cases to be processed immediately, then it's better to go with a larger lab. But if you have one or two, three individuals, maybe four individuals, that's not a problem for a smaller lab. Um, but whatever you do, right, whatever investigators go with, they need to make sure that it's a lab that not only can process these materials, but also interpret the data that comes out and that they have a good reputation for doing that. So would, would something that might be a little bit more realistic be like coming in at the end of the process where we've identified most of the people, or most of the people have been identified, but there's a couple people left that they don't even know where to look for family. So is that kind of like a more realistic point where your work would be really helpful? So it depends, mm -hmm. right? Because the questions that isotopes can answer or at least shed light on, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's take something like the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. right? Um, if we are dealing with a population of individuals that is coming from or we believe is likely coming from a variety of countries. And we could identify that, right? Because mm -hmm. we could look at the employment manifest and we could see who these commingled remains might belong to. Mm -hmm. In that particular instance, if we think that there's going to be variation, then isotopes could be helpful, right? Anytime where you believe that um, 
the population is going to have data within their skeleton or within their teeth that is going to differ from the local environment, that could be helpful. But if we're trying to determine, um, you know, populations from Palm Springs versus Indio, then isotopes are not the way to go. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what it is that you're dealing with in terms of the answers that you want to get, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's going to be variation present? And if so, based on other evidences that you have, then isotopes might be helpful, right? In the case scenario that you mentioned where you have one or two individuals mm -hmm. um, where you're, you're having a hard time identifying, then yeah, you could try and, and you would have to really confine your questions. Is this person born in this location, yes or no? Or really what we're asking is, are their isotopes consistent? with what we would expect for this location, yes or no? Mm -hmm. And if no, what are the other possibilities, right? So really good, isotopes do a good job of saying this person is not from here. They don't do a great job of saying where the person is from. And so you have to treat these other possibilities just as possibilities. Do you think that that will change as maps, as we do more mapping? Or is it kind of, all, is that just the nature of, of the work itself? It's the nature of the work. Isotopes are not like DNA, they're not unique. Mm -hmm. um, so the patterns that we see are repeated across the planet. Um, but the more isotopes that you get a chance to layer on top of each other, the mm -hmm. better you are at kind of predicting or, or demonstrating possible regions, right? And the other mm -hmm. thing is, is that this is why isotopes are only one piece of the pie and that why they need to be used with things like um, the biological profile, right? So having an ancestry of somebody that doesn't say Latino, but that says South American is really helpful from an isotopic perspective, right? Because then it helps you to kind of narrow down where you look and where you focus. Do you, are there, do issues like assumptions, can that, can that kind of make screwy results? Are, are, what, are, are those, would you consider those ethical challenges or are there ethical challenges involved in this work? Absolutely. So um, I think that anytime you deal with, um, with dead bodies, you know, you're, you're sampling material without permission, right? Mm. Um, and you're getting permission from law enforcement, but the person can't give you permission to take those samples. So there's definitely the ethical treatment of samples. I think that's a big issue with border crossers, right? And how those samples are being used um, and for what purpose. Um, and in terms of having information um, about the case, basically biasing, absolutely. Um, I think that cognitive bias is an is a incredibly important issue to take into consideration in all of forensics, including DNA. Um, and fingerprints, right? Not just um, forensic anthropology. So what we know beforehand can cause us to look at something um, in a way that's not appropriate, right? So sometimes we need information about somebody, about a person, um, like in the case of the biological profile, that information is handy, right? But let's say when you were doing your estimations of the biological profile, you found something on the person. Maybe they were wearing some kind of clothing. Maybe they were wearing a dress. And so then you automatically used that to influence your estimation of sex, mm -hmm. right? Which you shouldn't do. It's only what the bones tell you, not what the person has around them. So absolutely, I think that there are many instances in forensic anthropology and probably certainly in isotopes where being biased can, can give you results that you don't want. Have you been to Ishii before? I have. This is my second time. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the opportunity to go when it was in Raleigh mm -hmm. um, a couple years ago. And um, it was wonderful. And, you know, my major conference before attending Ishii was mm -hmm. the forensics conference mm -hmm. apps. And so you get all kinds of forensic focus there. You get DNA, psychology, right, anthro. Mm -hmm. um, but with Ishii, it's really great because it's really focusing, I think, a lot on DNA techniques and technologies that are new and upcoming and really getting down into the nitty gritty of what are the, the limitations of what we can do and why, right? And I think that really helps, especially when, um, for me, you know, I'm dealing with law enforcement and there's a lot of questions on things like ancestry identification markers and estimating facial um, structure from, from DNA samples. And it's really helpful for me to be here and to you know, get to know people better who are doing that on a daily basis.
And sometimes it seems like kind of themes emerge, databases and stuff like that, or you've mentioned trafficking, which someone else is covering. So do you, do you find the issues a place that you make connections or get ideas or absolutely. Take, yeah, get takeaways? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, it's been great because I had the chance to meet so many people already who are like, wow, I really think that what you're doing could help me. And, you know, maybe we can work together. And it's been great. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, the more lines of evidence that you have, um, the better case scenario that, you know, that's going to result from it. So absolutely. Cool. I think, you know, forensic anthropologists and um, our, our DNA colleagues need to work together a lot more. Um, we have a lot to learn from you guys, um, and um, I hope that we have something to offer in return. And I think that if we can be more collaborative, um, that we can actually do some really awesome things. So I look forward to that, and I hope that um, more of the, of the DNA folks will collaborate with forensic anthropologists in the future. If families are watching this, what message would you have for them? Um, I hope that it never happens to you, but if you ever find yourself in a situation where someone that you care for or that you love or that you know goes missing um, and you know you're, you don't know what happened to them, know that there are a lot of people working on cases just like this and they're doing a lot of that work behind the scenes and they're very, very dedicated forensic science professionals. You, you have to be your own advocate for yourself and for your family, but there are a lot of good people who are doing everything they can to make these identifications.